everyone. Today we have our former accounting professor, Professor Lisa McKinney, McKinney on the podcast. Lisa is one of the best teachers either of us have ever had, making even boring accounting topics like internal controls entertaining and comedic, using accents, stories, and even memes to teach us. In our first class session, I knew it was going to be different when she started off by saying that it was the 130th time that she had taught that class. In addition, to, in addition to being a professor, she is the director of the university's second largest community service program called the LIFT program. This program is designed to reach out to the Tuscaloosa communities and use both financial and human capital to improve the job skills of the adults and teen, the adult and teen populations, both on the student and subject sides. This organization mobilizes hundreds of students every semester into the community to do good. It helps the student and the community to develop into something greater than they were before. When I was in it, I did it. When I was in it, I did a business fundamentals class where we taught a local high school twice a week. And Lewis, what were you doing? Lisa and I went to prison like six times. It was great. We, <laughs> we taught computer literacy and financial literacy skills, Excel, Microsoft Word, and entrepreneurship to the inmates in Bibb County. Awesome. Interestingly enough, Lewis and I actually sat on the same row of your classroom for months without knowing it and <laughs> met each other. Uh, but with that, let's get into it. We can start with our questions, Lewis. Cool. So uh, how we know you as a professor, you know, you're very loud and outgoing and funny and involved in community service. Uh, were you like that? Like your whole life as a kid, were you loud and kind of in charge of the going on and or were you kind of a shy kid? And developed? Um. I think I was nervous and, and shy and kind of and nerdy. Um, I always cared about doing well in school. But then when I got into high school, I kind of got with the fun kids and had a good time. But I, I became more comfortable and got more extroverted as I got older. And I am truly, on every test that there is, a 99% extrovert. Oh and God. I've learned that during this quarantine because I am miserable. <laughs> the definition of an extrovert, I've been told, is somebody that gets their energy from other people. And an introvert is someone that gets their energy by being alone. I feel like I'm withering up. I'm trying to get used to doing Zoom calls and doing things, but I truly miss being next to people and being in a group of people. And it's, I mean, we're all having to adapt to it, but I'm really struggling. So I think I've always been a strong extrovert. I always did enjoy learning. I never had a problem with that. Now, there are some boring classes, no doubt. And I always make fun of literature classes, yeah, but funny. I, I never really hated school. Um, and I think that I've always been at heart, though, an extrovert in that what gets me up every day are the people around me and interacting with them. And a big thing to me that's been my whole life is I love people that are different. If you're from a different country, if you're from a different background, those are always the people I would seek out. I was always bored with somebody that was just like me. So I've really, all my life, sought out somebody that looked different, act different, talk different. Um, I love the differences in people. And I think that's been something, I've always tried to find those kind of people in my life. Sure, thank you, that's, that's great stuff. Uh, so you said you've always loved learning, not really been hating school. Uh, so when you decided to go to University of Alabama, how did you decide on accounting? So that's, I, I bumbled into it. My dad was an accountant in the U.S. Air Force, and we always like to joke about he would tell us how hard it was in Thailand and Laos, and we'd be like, dude, did you get a calculator burn? Because he wasn't exactly on the front lines, and we kind of like to tease him when he talks about Vietnam, because I was in my mom's belly when he was in Vietnam, but um, and we have some interesting furniture from Thailand because of it, but that's where it started. He, I have a very small family, and I've told this story before, but the only two real career paths in each side of my family are accountants and clowns. And I don't <laughs> think you could actually make that up. You mix uh, them a lot of my family, <laughs> yeah, professors both. But a lot of my family are in Connecticut um, and used to be in New York. So we're true Yankees. The other side's in Illinois, but we're Yankees. And several of the Connecticut family are clowns, literally. Like parties. I can't make that up. They had a, a business called Juggle Joy. They were Irish clowns. And then sometimes they bring out the Irish clown clover. So all I have as a background is accountants and clowns. Yeah, clowning doesn't make a lot of money. 
Um, and I, I guess my original plan went to the university. Um, I did like accounting. I mean, I got lucky in it because it wasn't boring. Um, I'd always kind of joke, you've heard me say in class, you don't have to be a genius to do accounting. And I'm certainly not. And I always try to tell students, I'm not that smart, as you can tell. Accounting was something, and business was something I realized that I didn't have to be a genius, and hard work and dedication was gonna get me as far as I needed to go. And so maybe Calculus 3 wasn't for me, um, but counting challenged me and had me think differently, and I liked that. And then why I stayed in it is I saw the value of it. Mm -hmm. I think in school, I, saw, I didn't get how you use this. I never got the power that accounting gives you. And you know, I say it all the time, it's the language of business. I don't think I really got that until I was in business and I was like, money is being allocated, resources are being allocated based on accounting. If you don't get accounting, you're locked out of all that. Mm -hmm. So um, I got my accounting degree at UA. Um, I graduated in 94 and then I got my master's in tax. And why I ended up in tax was I had considered going to law school and tax is all law. Okay. I always kind of joke about this. The main two career paths for accountants are audit, auditors and tax and auditors. Um, it's better if you're a good rule follower, but I've always kind of been a rule breaker and a sketchy person and tax was perfect for me because <laughs> the whole point of tax was this to try to find your way around the rules and be sketchy. And so I always say in my classes, my best friend's an auditor. She's a partner in a Memphis accounting firm. And she stops at stop signs and says the letters S-T-O-P to make sure she comes to a complete stop. <laughs> That's an auditor. She loves being an auditor. I'm the person that will absolutely go through the stop sign if possible. That's a tax person. Well, so, I'm an accounting major, so I think you might have just convinced me to... <laughs> tax is just... Part. It's all arguments. It's all twisting things. It's so much more fun and you can't really see that in school. Auditing is making sure someone is following the rules. As a person that doesn't like to follow rules, it would have been a terrible choice for me. Yes, ma'am. And you said you, you came to the university in 94 and you, you were there presumably for about six years and then you came so back. So I graduated from undergraduate in 94 uh -huh. and graduate in 95. So I started in 90. So, and that was such a fun time. The university then only had 19,000 people and tuition was $950 oh. because I got my presidential scholarship and it would be $950. The dorm was $950. They're almost exactly the same. Can you believe that? Yeah. That was going to be my question was, was how has the culture of the university changed over the years? Yeah. You've been there so a while. When I, that's a great question. When I went here, there was a ton of in-state students. It sure. was at that time, gosh, I don't even know the numbers, but I just, if you saw people from out of state, it wasn't common. Now it's been so, remember me saying how much I love people that are different? Mm -hmm. The most fun to me has been mm -hmm. over the last 10 years, seeing how we've become a school where most of the students are not from Alabama. That has made, I think, the university so much better. People think differently and people act differently. And that's been one of the best things that ever happened to UA culturally. That's awesome. I mean, I'm, come, I'm, Kyle, I'm from Las Vegas, Kyle's from Alabama and still doing this from Zoom. So that's, that's great. So <laughs> after you finished, how long did you spend, after you finished in school, how long did you spend in like your actual professional accounting career? Sure. And you still do any so of I that? Started, yeah, I started at Cooper's and Library in Birmingham, which is now PricewaterhouseCoopers. And then I went to um, a large firm in Memphis. Then I went back to Birmingham. Oh, no, I was all over the place. But for about nine years, I was a CPA in tax consulting, and I never planned to leave it. I loved it. Now, I'm not saying I loved every day. I mean, public accounting is brutal sometimes. But I liked being around really smart people that worked hard, and that was fun. And we were kind of the play hard, work hard kind of people, and so that was a good environment for me. Then I got an email one day in the year 2000, it was the year 2001, I think. And it said, hey, we're having auditions for, audition was the word, audition. for a professor, auditions, for a professor at the University of Alabama. And so my plan was to go in and get to teach at night. That was my plan. I was gonna stay on my path to being a partner in an accounting firm, but just teach at night. Mm -hmm. And so I went in and I had my audition 
and I actually remember bringing in bananas and a safari hat. But and, and why they hired me, I don't know. The guy before me was crying when he left. So I knew I had this. So even though I brought in bananas and a safari hat, I got the job. I'm pretty sure it's because the competition wasn't too stiff. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta stand out in an audition. Bananas and a safari hat would probably do that. Oh, I don't know what I did with bananas. I'm sure it was some dorky thing like accounting is an adventure. And they were probably like, we can have the guy weeping or we could take the nutty lady. <laughs> All right, nutty lady. <laughs> you got the job. Got uh, it. It's so easy to get. Did you start out part-time or did you start? No, they right said, uh, so I thought I could run the show and I was going to dev all my classes when I want them. They're like, nope, you either take it full-time or you don't take it. And I was like, here was my thought process. This doesn't work. I can just go back. You can always go back to public accounting. Right. So yeah. I was just like, let me see what this is like. And it was really hard to leave because I was at a firm called Sellers Richardson, which is now RSM in Birmingham at the summit. And man, they're great people. And I could have seen myself being there for the next 20 years. That was such a hard thing to leave. But I've been there 17 years and I never done did go back to public accounting. <laughs> well now, huh? Did you uh, do a lot of like consulting and board work with public accounting firms? Yeah, I, I got to do that. And that's what I think I can bring to the classroom now. Uh -huh. My job is so much fun because I can go, I've never seen that in my life. We're skipping that. The real world aspect of accounting makes accounting bearable, I think, when you okay. can actually, that, it, that, it, that it's not just in the book. So that is why I've stayed at this job and loved it is, I learned so much in those nine years because public accounting is you need to multiply the years times three or maybe like times seven for dog years, maybe seven. So I was in there 63 years. <laughs> um, you learn so much because you work seven days a week, 14 hours a day. And so the fun to me was I get to bring back all these stories and the reality that has been such a joy because remember, I'm an extrovert and it is all about the people. Yeah. So what's been your biggest challenge in being a professor at UA? Uh, I guess starting out, what was the biggest challenge for you? I was very, very bored. I realized <laughs> I, believe that. I was so bored, I couldn't even stand it. I was used to working 80, 90, 100, 110, even charged 120 hours one week. I loved to work. I loved having a group of people and being really active. So that's when I started trying to find something else to do. Okay. So I started doing continuing education and I still do that where I teach at accounting firms. And I love that. Then I was still bored. So <laughs> I started the Culver house lift program and mm. I've now I'm back to working 120 hours a week and I'm as happy as I could ever be. <laughs> so I was bored. <laughs> and so you're not bored now. Well, a little bit because of yeah. quarantine, but maybe not. <laughs> not, not, not bored. <laughs> That's good. Uh, so back to teaching accounting for a second. Mm -hmm. Well, for non-accounting people or people that haven't taken any accounting classes, what would you say are like the one, two or three fundamental things just a lay person should know about accounting? You know, it kind of goes back to the first thing is whatever you're going to do, I always joke, unless you're going to live on an island as a hippie and only barter, then you should take a basic accounting class. I always bring up my husband who's an orthodontist and I make a lot of jokes about it, but he took accounting and man, is that smart you are locking yourself out of the world of money if you can't try to understand accounting. Here's the second thing. It's not as hard as you think it is. And you guys remember this. Mm -hmm. It's common sense and logic. When we have an account that has the cost of a building, we call the account building. If you've <laughs> paid for your rent already, you've paid for it, we call it prepaid rent. We're not trying to hide things. You're not, that's the whole point. You can't hide things. Anybody can understand accounting because all you have to do is break through and get the common sense. Not everybody can understand chemical engineering, covalent bonds. Mm -hmm. This, everybody can do. You're an evangelist for accounting. I love it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Bring it to the people. Uh -huh. So, um, and maybe you asked for three things. The third thing, it's not as boring as it appears. I get bored in the Winn-Dixie line if one person is in front of me. I have the attention span of a gnat. I get bored, it's terrible how bad I get. How would I have made it this long in accounting if it was that boring? It's not. 
what you see in a textbook seems boring. <laughs> well, I, look, it seems like you just started doing other things. Uh, I did. I had more, I needed to do more things, but you know what? I still love accounting. It's still interesting. It is not dull because if you can just pull up the financial statements of Apple and look and see that they have $300 billion in cash, that's so interesting. And you can say they're going to buy Disney. <laughs> you can right. make out claims like that. And then, you know, Tesla, that's always one to look up. They're fun. Yeah. Uh, what's the story again about Leonardo da Vinci's friend? I like the way you tell that story about <laughs> this, this guy. So the guy that invented uh, accounting is Luca Pacioli, P-A-C-I-O-L-I. -I. Pull up his Wikipedia and there's a picture of him. And in the background is Leonardo da Vinci. His best friend was Leonardo da Vinci. He was a monk and in 1494 in Venice, Italy, he invented the accounting equation, the balance sheet, the income statement. And we haven't changed it in over 500 years. Apple uses the language he created and it's not been modified. That is unbelievable. Yeah. And um, did you know that the only thing that Da Vinci ever actually published in his life was in Pacio or Pacioli's um, math book that he published? I didn't know that. And yeah. it might be Pacioli. Because I'm not sure it, what it is. It could be. I don't know because nobody likes to talk about him. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nobody wants to bring that up at a party. But yeah, I. <laughs> It, the picture of him in Wikipedia is hilarious, but that didn't know that Leonardo da Vinci, that was the only thing he published? He never published in his life, yeah. Everything that he would do, he would either keep himself or continue to refine. I, I read um, the Walter Isaacson uh, biography, or half of it, earlier this yeah. year, and that was one of the things that he touched on. Um, it's like a, a octahedron, I think, is the... The rhombododecahedron. Yeah. That's in the Wikipedia, too. Yes! <laughs> That drawing. I mean, why do we need that? Who is okay. using the rhombododecahedron? <laughs> Not a cat. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's something that you think a lot of professors do wrong that could be easy to correct to improve the quality of their classes or learning experience for the students? I think one of the things that sometimes they do wrong is they're not reading their audience and looking at their audience. What I'm trying to do the whole time is go, all right, I know some people are always not gonna be paying attention, but have I lost the room? If I've lost the room, I can feel it, and I need to back up or move forward. You are, you have to watch that audience and look at everybody in the eye, and you will see the physical movements that indicate they don't know what you're doing, they don't care what you're doing, and you've got to adjust and adapt and try to pull it together. So I'm always looking at people. I like to walk around when I teach. The only reason I'm walking around is because I'm trying to look at different people. I can feel their vibe. I know that sounds corny, but I can feel in the room when everyone is miserable. I don't know. It's almost like these little molecules are flying around of misery. And then I'm like, all right, all right, let's do something else. The other hard thing to do I think we all have trouble with is we've got super smart people. We've got people that are struggling and everybody in the middle. How do you teach to everybody? You're boring somebody while somebody else is lost. So again, it comes down to trying to really talk to people and feel it. And then I like to ask people, but the whole reading of the slides and not watching what's happening in the audience is garbage. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah. I, you know, I, and, and I've had to, I've had to been, um, taping my online classes, That's which is like time. pulling my hair out strand by strand, because I always say if I had to do online, I wouldn't do it. Well, now I'm doing it. I'm, it was at first, my first few videos, it was hard. And then I just pretended those people were there and I just talked and act like they were there. I paused. I think I'm going to do Zooms and uh, things like that, because I think I'm going to need to connect. Mm -hmm. with them and I think they're going to need to connect with me. So I've done these online videos, but I'm realizing I'm going to have to see some of these people in the face, you know, for the upper level classes at least. Yeah. yeah. It'll be really interesting to see how all of this plays out with the, the quarantine and online courses. <laughs> and, like, the long -term it's going to be hilarious. <laughs> I saw some memes and videos making fun of professors 
and they're terrible, you know how bad we're gonna be. Like yeah. there's just been some memes of the professor being like, hello, you know, not if you can't even see them and they're no, they're right. just, oh. Or they're way too close. No. Yes, yes, I saw that though. <laughs> <laughs> trying to get better. Online stinks for me, but it's it's I'm getting better, you know. It's gonna be a learning curve for everybody. Uh, I, think that would be <laughs> I keep people. hearing that, the learning curve. <laughs> learning curve. That's funny. Uh but yeah, so that was a great discussion about you in the classroom and see a lot of your enthusiasm that explains your energy and all that. Let's go a little bit more into uh, the lift program. Can you explain why you started it and kind of how it started, uh, the general backstory on that being founded? Yeah, August 1994, uh, 1994, 2014, a student named David Hose came in my office. He uh, was a graduate accounting student, then he went to Ernst & Young, and now he is the finance and IT senior manager for Peloton in New York City. That's he awesome. He did that in six years. He is, some, he walked into job. my office and he said, I've been trying to find a way to get business students to help in the community. And I said, no, that's my idea. I've been having that idea. And we always joked about how we didn't know how to cook. We didn't know how to give people shots to give them vaccines, but we were always trying to make a difference in the community. And we were both bored. He was bored too. So he, we sat down and within a week, we begged for money for 10 terrible computers. And we went out to a community center in the low income district and started having computer classes. And over the last uh, six years, we've grown from that little, me and David being the only people doing it to 575 volunteers. I do wow. believe we may have passed Al's pals, but you have to figure out how you measure that. But my entire goal in life is to beat Al's pals. I think we beat them in hours, but they are my enemy. So it started out, and for six years, here's the fun thing. Everything was organic, because that's how I do things. I don't sit down and strategically plan, which makes UA mad at me all the time, because they're like, what are your goals and objectives? I'm like, do this again. I have no goals and objectives. Lyft has grown to 60 classes a week this semester, 575 student volunteers and leaders, without me trying to make it bigger. Every time a student came to me and said, I want to do this, I want to go here, or somebody in the community said, I heard you were doing this, would you consider doing this? It's so much fun that way. For example, uh, a student came to me in November last year and said, have you thought of going to the juvenile detention center? I thought, no. And she said, I know people uh, that work there and nobody comes out to the juvenile detention center, which is like teen jail, if you think about it. And so we started two classes at juvenile detention center and they're awesome. It is literally teen jail, but that's been fantastic. I never thought of that idea. A student wanted to do it and then it happened. Everything is lift, had nothing to do with me. It had someone else that brought it to me. So again, every year it's grown, so that was August 2014. So you can see we've got six years, right? Um, and we were supposed to be the subject of Bama Blitz. I don't know if you've heard of Bama Blitz. It was about, it was supposed to kick off like this week and it's a, uh, it a, fundraising? a fundraising campaign. I guess I was getting that helicopter I always wanted, but we had it canceled and we will be the subject of Bama Blitz in the fall, but that's a university wide fundraiser among alumni. Okay. So Lyft will finally have a budget. Lyft oh, has awesome. never had a budget, <laughs> never had a line item. So it's the biggest community service organization on campus and it's operating without a budget. Well, we're going to have to read the intro. Which we, it's so funny. I mean, we have pieced it together and, you know, and people, you know, I'll see people with organizations, they'll be like, we received a $3 million grant. And I'm like, we have nine crappy Dells and I'll pick you up in my car. I mean, it's just the worst, but you get the fun of it has been, here's a secret I'm going to tell you. If you are not a line item, line item on the UA budget, you have, you can do a lot of things. When okay. nobody is paying attention to you, you don't cost anybody money. You can do whatever you want. 
flexible. That's been the secret of Lyft. It never would have got here. We would have a staff of 95 people telling me what to do and me filling out rubrics. But there's no such thing because we haven't cost in money. <laughs> so, that's been our greatest secret is that we are the cheapest community organization you have ever seen. Mm. I don't get paid for it and I don't want to mm -hmm. because look at universities that have community, oh, just community foundations. And you'll hear something like the uh, president of that community foundation makes a million dollars. How do you feel when you hear that? I get depressed. I'm like, dude, you're doing it for a job. We're all in it and we're all not making money. Now let's go do something. Thank you. That's awesome. You've got something like 20 graduate students. Like, So now uh, we have seven graduate assistants okay. that for 211, uh, the, now the 210 class sold 211. And that's been something that our department head, Rich Houston, has helped me with. Boy, has that helped me. But they're like my seven best friends. Every year they change and I get new graduate assistants. But that's that's my team. I guess that's like the seven doors. I haven't thought about it. Used to be one, no people, then it was two people, and now we're up to seven, and those are graduate assistants. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so Kyle had a good question he put in our little show notes. I wanted to ask, and I'm just going to ask it because I just saw it. So who do you think gets most impacted by Lyft, the students or the actual people they're volunteering for? Boy, that's a tough question. Um, I think it's absolutely 50-50. When I started it, I was 100% community initiative. I, could, I was not thinking of experiential learning. Mm -hmm. But the reason I had to defend it to UA, I can't just ball, ball into UA and say, hey, man, I'm, I want to do this for the community. But that's what we were motivated by. What happened organically with no effort by us was that as we were forced to justify why it was part of the class, and we would joke in the beginning, we'd make up garbage, steal it from other websites and stuff. And then we were like, oh, this is true. And then we realized the best thing a future business leader can learn to do is to be a part of their community, learn how to work with people from different backgrounds, problem solve, think critically, adapt on the fly. You've heard the word pivot. If you lead a lift class, everything will go wrong. And that is business. And that's what I can guarantee for everyone that leads a lift class. One week, you will have 20 people from the community and three volunteers. I will get you 17 more volunteers and you will have 20 student volunteers and two people from the community will come the next week. And then we will do this, it's just hilarious. We will go back and forth and until we get the one and one ratio. We call it the golden ratio. One community participant to one UA student. But I'm telling you, Lyft is a disaster. It's messy and it's chaos. Running a business is messy and chaos. I can't teach you that in a classroom, but I can throw you into a room where people are mad at you. People, they're not paying for the class. There's a subreddit called Choosing Beggars, which is one of my favorite ones. Most of the people are very grateful, but guess what business is like? Whatever a customer has paid, even if it's zero, there is gonna be a point where they complain. And so the student has to deal with the complaint. Mm -hmm. That's a growing up time. Yeah. So that's, at the end of the day, I think we're down to 50-50. I think it's exactly half and, and that makes the U, UA certainly happy, so I can justify having as part of a class and now justify having a budget. But initially, I thought it was all going to be community. And then this fancy experiential learning came around the corner. And you know that's been okay. the hottest thing. Yeah. Ten years ago, there's no such thing. We yeah, didn't think I learned so much from, from my, Lyft, my Lyft class, of, um, you know, about the community. Like, we, we went to a, a low-income high school central high school and um, across the street is where like all of the people that have money basically that go to Alabama live in that big like park view like it's basically mansions for students and across yes. the, street, like, the literacy rates I don't even I don't even want to guess it, it was just it was, it was almost sad to to see um, but I did learn a ton about myself about the community about so yeah, I mean, that experiential, experiential learning is a real thing, you know? 
let's give an example of that. One of the big topics in the world right now is minimum wage. Okay. So if I, my family has already always had, you know, decent money and never had money problems and I've never really seen it. I don't understand what living on minimum wage looks like. When you go into a high school where 90% of people get free lunches and you start interacting with them and you start talking about them with finances, think about when you're a business leader down the road, won't that experience impact you and make you a more compassionate and better business leader? Your generation of people is not putting up with the greedy corporate jerks as much as our generation did. There's a real push, and I don't know when it will ever topple over, but 30 years ago or 20 years ago, nobody complained about corporate greed like they do now. There's a huge movement. We even have a presidential candidate solely, right? I mean, Bernie is solely behind toppling these cor corporate greedy giants. There's a that movement is getting bigger and bigger. So whichever side of the fence you are politically, how about you just go and hang out with those people and then actually try to do a budget with them yeah. or try to talk about all the issues. You'll hear people say, well, they don't have money, but they had money for a phone, but I got, all right. Did you know any of these people? Did you talk to them about this? Let's, you don't know anything until you sit down with those kids and you understand that they don't have an ACT tutor and no ACT classes, so they got a 16. You had an ACT tutor and you got a 34. From that moment on, your lives will never be close to the same. Yeah. And so whatever political stance you have, I'm glad that you can have it. You know, some people are like, are you a flaming liberal? Are you a Republican? You know what? I don't care about any of that. What I want you to do is go out there with me and then make your decision on how you want to do things. If you still want to pay only minimum wage, then you have had an education and you've seen what it's like. But you might at the very least understand the struggles of the people that are making the stuff in the factory when you're making the million dollar salary. Yeah, at least it's a qualified decision once you've seen. You yeah, know. whatever your decision is gonna be, at least I've exposed you to something. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I think there's so many students and like you're saying uh, earlier at the beginning of this, you have students coming into Alabama from everywhere uh, mm -hmm. when previously it's just people in the state and you're showing this perspective, especially, you know, College of Business is very popular with the out-of-state students. Uh, these people come from California, New York, Nevada, just all these states very far from Alabama and putting them in these completely different environments unlike anything they've ever would have seen otherwise. Uh, going into prisons, going into the VA, going into high schools, elementary schools and saying, look, these are it's a completely different experience talking about it versus going in and doing it. Uh, how are you able to structure it into the class? Because that's a really interesting incentive, stru not incentive structure, I want to say, but you just found a way to ensure people will do it. Can you? So can, that's funny. Like, in the beginning, we so stumbled fun. around. Yeah, we had no structure in the beginning. And I started offering it for extra credit in some of my classes. I had a big backlash among several professors that said, students should not get extra credit for doing this garbage. And I was like, oh, ho, ho, now you're bringing it on. So from that moment on, we worked to structure it so that we could defend it. I wasn't ready for that and it was easy to defend. So it became the lab component for the honors AC210 class. And the AC 210, now 211, Intro to Financial Accounting class, there used to be only one honor section of 40. Then it became an honor section of 100. Now it's three honor sections. So um, that was, there. there's my 300 volunteers right there. There's the start of 300. Then it became its own lift class. But we know the honors college has these different pillars, and one of them obviously is community civic engagement. And so as the honors class, again, this is how I spend my whole life. I bumble and back, backwards fall into everything. I was like, yeah, yeah, it's part of the honors lab because the honors lab, you know, didn't plan this, but I had to defend it because I was getting a lot of backlash from old school people that were like, they need to be in a classroom learning from a book, learning from me, from my lecture. And I, so over time, and it was so easy, I had to defend it as part of the experiential learning movement that was emerging around me. 
I don't know why the lights shine on me sometimes and I get so much luck, but the time that experiential learning was becoming so cool and so popular was when we started Lyft. It was unbelievable. Lyft would never have happened when I went to school in the early 90s. None of us cared about any of that stuff. We didn't think about other people like that. We were busy littering and you know, destroying the environment. We were very busy with that. So it's now its own class. The, the reason now it's cl a class, you can, you can be a leader of classes and take a three hour honors elective is this movement of experiential learning. Over the last 10 years, universities in America have exploded this concept of what used to be called service learning mm -hmm. and learning outside the classroom. So I don't have problems anymore with it. It ended up working for me, but I never planned it that way. That's amazing. That's yeah, and you, you went to the prison. I never- How did that get started? It, the prison was amazing. Someone approached me and said, I heard that you did uh, financial literacy and computer classes. You ever thought about going to the prison? I was like, I can assure you, I did not think of that. I <laughs> never thought of prisons ever. David Hose, remember the co-founder that's at Peloton now, one of his friends from high school hit somebody, a little kid while he was drunk and killed the little girl. This was right before David Hose came to the University of Alabama. When he came to the University of Alabama, his best friend went to jail. Wow. Now, for that DUI, for the driving drunk and killing someone. So that motivated David. David talked to me a lot about his best friend, and I started viewing prisoners as people. I never thought about them. Mm -hmm. And I and I went, you know, I always tell the joke about I went to the university and I was like, hey, could I take a bunch of guys to Bib Correctional? And they were like, blankety blank, no. And I was <laughs> like, all right then. So I wrote up something, I was like, let me try this. What if it was, and they were like, no. I spent a whole four months being told no, and then someone said yes, and then here we are, and you know what a cool experience that was. Mm -hmm. I totally have compassion for inmates now. I, I did, and now I understand the cost to society of a terrible correctional system. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand. I'd always read an article about Alabama has the worst corrections department in the whole universe. And I'd be like, well, you know, I, I don't really care about that. Now I talk to people that have been in for 25 years. And honestly, I do know what they've done a lot of the time. They'll sometimes mm -hmm. talk to me about it. And I'll see a person that I've worked with for six months that I feel some of them two years in my mind feels like they could make a contribution to society but they're not getting out anytime soon. And I'm like, okay, we're spending $30,000 a year. Keep you in here. Everything's a mess. What a disaster. And the minute you get out, you won't be able to do anything because nobody wants to hire you. I think that's what you saw, right? Mm -hmm. what, 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 uh, what did you get out of the prison thing? I, I definitely got a similar experience. Um, I, a lot of those guys, I like you instructed us or kind of advised us to do while we're in the program, don't be overly curious about the backstory and the history of the people you're talking to, because that might uh, have an effect on your ability to have a normal conversation yes. with them and just act like uh, two people hanging out, trying to play solitaire for a couple hours or <laughs> make, some, make some PowerPoints or try to draw some fun things in Microsoft Paint, because definitely no internet access. That would be, no that'd be, internet. That, would be that would be a step too far. But I mean, when you approach them like that and just hear their ideas for the things they'd like to do if they were back in society or what goals they'd like to do and the things that, like like you said, they could definitely contribute. And a lot of them, they're not, at least the group that you know we were exposed to or the people that have had good behavior for a number of months and at least have some prospect of getting out, uh, they think of like interesting things to do and they don't seem to be like, overly resentful uh, about the world. They are very sorrowful and uh, reflective about the experiences that they've had and the mistakes they've made in their past and they don't want to just kind of sit and exist for an That's indefinite right. future. I'll you know? tell you something you don't know we started this semester was a student came to me and said, I would like to start a creative writing class at Bib Correctional. I said, all right, sure. We started a creative writing class, just a small group of five inmates. 
it has been the coolest thing. The I, first some day I had to do photocopies of uh, Antigone. I don't even know what that is. Is it a Greek tragedy? I don't know. They've read um, Homer's Odyssey. Again, not even sure what that is. What a cool thing. Three of the guys in that class already had uh, published a book, but they sit there for two hours and they do creative writing. Uh, and we're trying to move towards a program where we're gonna publish the prisoner's work on a website. Mm -hmm. Now, we won't identify the prisoner or the victim or anything like that, but we wanna put, this is my next step, we wanna put the art the prisoners are drawing, the poetry the prisoners are writing, the stories and writings that reflect their angst, their sorrow, um, and you know, that's kind of the writing process. Some of them are getting out their regrets, their anger, their processing over 25 years. Yeah. That'll be some stuff I would like to read. Oh, absolutely. And that'll get people really thinking about this is a person. Yeah. They're not trash that we throw away. It is a person. And that we first need to understand that. It's a big difference. Yeah. yeah. Let it come from them. And that's something Kyle and I talk about a lot uh, is like writing really is like thinking, you know, thinking is very mm -hmm. incomplete. If you're just in your head, you, you don't really make it very far. If you're just stewing over ideas in your head, it's not until you actually try to write them down and structure yes. them in a way that you'd be able to communicate them to another person. That they yeah, actually writing, writing and speaking are mediums of thinking. Exactly. It's Ooh, or, that's good. That's true. Yeah. So you're not really completing your think your thinking's incomplete or, uh, underdeveloped until you actually take the it's time. It's a blob. When it's you blob, put it on the exactly. paper, it gets organized and you flesh it out. That is so true. I've not really ever thought about that. When I have to put it in writing, things really come together and you see exactly. your flaws in thinking. Yes? Exactly. Yeah. And that gives you the opportunity to then redirect your thinking instead of holding the same thoughts and memory for however long and stewing over them. Okay, now you've gotten those out of your head. You've cleaned them up a little bit and now you've freed up the space and attention for adding to them and fixing them and combining them with other thoughts. So I think that's yeah. a really interesting program that'll come out of the prisons is seeing what they write in their memoirs or whatever they want to put together. I, I absolutely, I can't wait to get that started. So right now we can't get in the prisons. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah, well that's, that's a pretty uh, good discussion about left and probably a good transition into what is going on right now. Uh, when we emailed you asking you if you wanted to do this, because we figured, you know, you're probably up to something pretty interesting. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing past couple of weeks, past couple sure. months in response to everything that's going on in the world right now? Absolutely. Everything on Thursday night before spring break, that was the night we got the email from Alabama. Mm -hmm. I had been that's watching fine. it. Uh, the subreddit coronavirus has kept me. I've known everything for three months. I've followed everything. So Reddit knows. I knew we were shutting down. Mm -hmm. I was waiting and I knew. That one day, that next day, I was processing on Friday night or Saturday morning after we got that announcement, I sent an email and a text to my contacts in West Birmingham. And I said, we need to meet on Monday morning in Birmingham to talk about the crisis the humanitarian crisis that's about to happen in Birmingham. And in the last week, we've worked 20 hours a day to put together a coalition to help distribute food. Um, so we're working in Ensley, Wylam, Fairfield, everywhere in Birmingham. And as you know, the number of unemployed people has just rocketed. So we're working with one of the organizations is called Grace Klein Community, and they feed 10,000 people a month in Birmingham. That has, times. what's that? that? Like in just a stamp, like normally that's what they're. Yeah, fasting. yeah, they're huge. They're now already five times that. So we put a proposal together in two days that uh, said the humanitarian crisis is coming and we need to be positioned. These are the things we need, refrigerated box truck, you know, regular box truck. We need, we need a pallet lifter, we need metal shelving. So we set up these hubs where we're gonna distribute from and we set up an organization where there's gonna be the least amount of contact with the end user. Okay. We can't, the way it usually works at a food bank is everybody comes to the food bank and grabs everything. And there can be a hundred people there at one time. 
If we did that now, there'd be a thousand people there. So that wasn't going to work. So we sped, set up a almost a dorky little flow chart of where we had main hubs, sub hubs, distribution centers, and then the end user. We're using churches and community centers as the distribution arm. So they're dropping things off on people's doorsteps. No one is coming to the food bank. Okay. And so we presented that to um, an organization called Birmingham, Movement Birmingham, which is a group of business leaders that uh, want to do good things and help out. And so things are really moving, but the thing I want to note is how quickly things are really descending already in America. Mm-hmm. Is I don't think I would know unless I had these connections with the people running the food banks. They are working as hard as they can. Every time they get a truckload of food, it's gone. We are going to see some ugly stuff with the unemployment. Now, the government passed something, and that's going to help. But at the end of the day, this is going to be pretty unbelievable. We're going to see hunger and needs that we've never seen in our lifetimes in America. It's going to be crazy. Wow. So that's, I, I kind of reached out to them. And, and so I'm using university students right now because that's what I do. I use your, university students. Your militia. <laughs> that's my militia. My militia is right now, they're upgrading their technology so we can do more. Two, they're trying to get funding by contacting businesses. Three, they're calling restaurants to get leftover food and supplies. Four, they're sending uh, thank you notes, donor acknowledgement. I've got one of my students, Grace, who has just got accepted to Harvard Law School. She is heading up a team of 100 sewers that are sewing cloth masks, mm-hmm. and she's being the coordinator because we all know the the N95 masks are all gone right now. So yeah. I mean, this another alternative is the cloth the masks. But she's a business student, and what she's doing is we got to get the supplies in. That's logistics, right? Mm-hmm. Sewers aren't doing that. They're sewing. So what my student Grace is doing is coordinating the effort like she's leading a business. I have about 30 students at least right now working on things for the food bank. And it's making the students feel better because they're bored and they're miserable at home. And not everybody wants to do this, but everybody I've reached out to has said, please let me help. I'm so frustrated and upset and I'm bored and I want to do something. It's really picking a lot of their spirits up. Your generation wants to help other people. My generation really didn't care when we were in college. We didn't care at all. I mean, there was very few people. That is an intricate part of who you people are. Whatever we're calling your your generation, the best thing about your generation is a true concern for other people that I have not seen in any of the other generations. That's what makes you guys different. That's that's a really healthy optimism that you're talking about with our generation because a lot of people don't have that perspective. So it's, it's refreshing. I didn't expect it. It's another thing that got thrown to me in life. As building Lyft, this generation wants to serve other people. It's unbelievable. You guys care more than any other generation cares. Thank you. And <laughs> that's, uh, sounds like, in, I mean, that's what you're talking about, that strategic plan and that spring, wow. Thursday before spring rape was only about 10 days ago. So you really, you're working quickly, it sounds like. You know, you're sounding like you're just lot going you're working on, on for, uh, for years, but I guess you've been building the skills to throw something like that together overnight for a couple of years. Well, when I have access to university students, I feel like I can do anything. I like that you called them a militia. Mm-hmm. I never would have done any of this. I literally have 30 people at this very moment trying to do, I just text them, email them, and I go, I need research on cloth masks and the effectiveness of cloth masks. I need a sewing design for cloth masks. I need to know how much a pallet lifter costs. I need to know what a scissor lifter is. I don't know what that is. What is it? How much does it cost? Where can we get one? The students do it better than I, and it wouldn't happen without university students. Todd, did you have a question? Um, I was gonna say detaching from like the human side of this and how horrible it is. Um, from, from an accounting background, how do you think, uh, the markets and, and economics in America are going to be affected by um, 
coronavirus? Yeah, short term, medium term, long term. Boy, that's a tough question. That's the hardest question I've gotten in a long time. Here's my thought. I economic stimulus packages that we've gotten are great. What I always have in the back of my mind is our deficit. Mm -hmm. I believe we had to have stimulus and, and we do have to do this. We can't just let people out there, all these businesses fail. But when is this deficit? Don't How much it. longer can our balance sheet not balance? How much longer can our equity be negative? Um, from an accounting point of view, I don't understand when the tipping point will be. So the increasing deficit, how astronomically out of control it's gotten, scares me. Maybe that's an old fashioned way to look at it. But if the US government is a business, we're a business that's in trouble, you know? Um, I wouldn't invest. You know what it's going to mean is we're going to have to raise tax rates mm -hmm. and that has its own ramifications. Everything has so many complicated second order, third order consequences that it's very difficult to make predictions on these kind of things. I'm scared of the long term, but I know that we had to do something. Mm -hmm. What, what would have been the alternative not to do it? Yeah, no. not to, just to let everything fail to let that it's, it's tough. It's no, I mean, you can't do that. So are we going to go through some crazy times when you guys are out making money? Are you going to probably have higher tax rates? Yes. Yes. I mean, I'm sorry, but you know, at one point in America, the highest marginal tax rate was like 94%. Now that was Carnegie's and Rockefeller's, but at some point we're gonna have to pay the piper and it might be you guys <laughs> making your big money that pay the piper but your generation might be more willing to pay taxes than my generation is. <laughs> because again, you're more of a give back society instead of a keep my stuff society. I don't know. Well, I think our generation is going to um, vote Bernie in and then <laughs> That's right. He'll fix it. <laughs> taxes. Yeah. That's right. Uh, Carl, you want to get into some of the kind of bonus round? Yeah, grab, absolutely. Grab back. Uh, yeah. Right. So I'll go with the first one. Um, what would be your advice to people getting started in college and people uh, about to leave college? Ooh, getting started in college. Oh, you're going to laugh at what I'm about to say. Alrighty. I'm going to say it because this is what I truly believe. If you can avoid a serious relationship with a significant other. <laughs> I have seen so many people make terrible decisions in college with people that the chances of you being with them the rest of your life are very slim. Tone down the drama in college with your significant other relationships. I'm sorry, I really feel that is the advice I will give to my kids when they're in college. For goodness sake, why do you have to have a serious person right now? Why? Why can't you just grow and not have insecurities and jealousies of other people? You know, I don't know if you guys see your friends doing this, not doing things because they have a significant other that is telling them not to do it. Kyle and I are laughing because Kyle has a pretty serious girlfriend, I'd say. they've been. Well, and, and you know what? That's not for everybody. Yeah. She may let you do what you need to do in your life, and she may really have her, your best intentions at heart. A lot of people don't. She may be a keeper and a winner and good for you. You should keep her. But I think so many I see, I literally had a conversation a month ago with a girl that wasn't going to go to law school at Stanford because her musician boyfriend didn't want to leave uh, Nashville because he was about to be a success. I about threw something. I was like, so you're not going to go to Stanford law school because of the musician boyfriend. Man, that's okay. There's my feast, first piece of advice. Here's my second one. That's a Grades are uh, important and they open doors. Yes. But if you can, in certain classes, establish a relationship with a professor and truly learn and truly understand a subject, that is what college is about. Right? 
-hmm. So that sounds so simple to say, but how many people just stumble through for the stupid grades? They find nothing they're passionate about and they never, they, college doesn't happen for them. It needs to be a renaissance. Mm -hmm. It needs to be a time where you go, man, I love this, man, I hate this and push your life in those directions. Be malleable and be willing to pivot as you learn what excites you. I think that's great. And as leaving college, is that was the other one? Yes, Am leaving college. Friend? Whew, leaving college. Okay, the first job that you take, you don't have to stay long at, it, so don't freak out. Just take something that's a good stepping stone and don't necessarily make your first decision on money. I will see students that will be like, I am taking the $49,000 job over the $48,000 job. And I'm like, what? Who cares? You won't care. The, that's not going to make any difference. The initial salary is actually not that important. The upward mobility and potential is all that matters. I've heard so, that so many times. I know I'm always like, really? $2,000 changed your decision? Really? That's so dumb. Uh, this is a fun question. I know you've brought up Reddit in this conversation a couple times and in class a bunch of times. Uh, so like, who are your favorite people on the internet or where are your favorite places to go? Uh, who do you follow on YouTube or what subreddits are you into right I'm now? Really, I am. I'm just unabashedly into Reddit. I think there's some really smart people out there on Reddit they say things that make me laugh where I start to cry. I, I mean, that's awesome. Not stupid humor, even just people with their one liners. Mm -hmm. um, so I really enjoyed, enjoyed is not the right word, the coronavirus um, website, because I feel like I've known what's going on and saw things coming. Mm -hmm. um, I like, um, there's oh, so much joy I have on the, with Reddit. I enjoy the choosing beggars, the, uh, Thanks, I hate it. The idiots in cars, the divorced birds. Oh, <laughs> there's so many. I get. It's, I never thought I would be this kind of person that would enjoy Reddit so much. A couple students mentioned it to me. I feel like I know these people. <laughs> I don't know why I get such a kick out of it. I love the ability to hone in in 10 seconds on exactly what I want to hear people talking about. Maybe that's it. And it okay. could be serious stuff. And it could be stupid stuff, relationship yeah, stuff, yeah, kids you stuff. Know what to expect. I, I can find it and then I can see a thousand people talking about it. Remember me going back to saying I liked different people and I liked what different people thought. Mm -hmm. I am a gray person, not a black and white person. And I love to hear both sides of an argument. And I love to see both sides of an argument. I I want to understand what people on both sides are thinking. People that like Trump, why do you like them? People that hate Trump, boy, that's 99% of Reddit. You can get that covered. All right, Bernie scares me because of the high tax rates. Why do you like Bernie? I want to hear that from a thousand different people. So I'll probably resonate with one of them. That's so interesting. I'm also big into audiobooks. So okay. I love nonfiction audiobooks. Uh, right now, this is a really creepy choice. I'm reading um, about the 1918 pandemic flu, which is creepy and depressing. Um, but I like comes back like it like the Spanish. I know it's you. You listen to it and you go, oh, it's exactly the same thing. The race for a cure, a vaccine, people making bad decisions, people being warned, and one person saying, "Do this." You're yeah. kind of like. This is happening again. Nothing. Yeah. Me and Lewis were trying to study the markets surrounding uh, the Spanish flu and, and, and what, you know, what we could draw from it. But it was, it was kind of um, tough because of the being sandwiched between two world wars, you know? Yeah, I mean, exactly. Because you're right. It was that, that's, and that's what a lot about the book talks about is we can't separate what was going on. Yeah. You're right. You don't. That's that's brilliant that you get that. You're right. Yeah, so, well, human nature stayed the same, but the context, the you know, the government policies, the financial regulations, the just geopolitical climate of the world at the time, and obviously all the dis changes in communication and information distribution from technology, uh, that's all different. So human human nature is the only real constant. You know, you're going to have the people that ignore 
the consensus of experts mm -hmm. because they are just always cynical of anything that would disrupt their way of life. Then you have the people that are over panicking and you have the people that are handling crisis and response horribly. And you have the people that are just in the middle kind of waiting for other people to tell them what to do. And it's, it's hard to stuck with me in the book when I was listening to it last night was this, I've been thinking about this. President Wilson was sending people over on these giant boats, troops, and the troops were deathly ill and it was such a catastrophic thing to do. But here's what the book was saying. It made me think about it. This is a flaw of humanity. President Wilson was so fixated and fixed on the war effort that he couldn't see the other stuff. But to be successful and win at something, you have to be 100% fixed on it. Okay. So what I was trying to see was that was a positive that all of his efforts were trying to get this war and, and win this war and get it done. Mm -hmm. But the downside was that it, he totally ignored the other things. So I was trying to think, uh, kind of applying that to my own life. If you really want to make something happen that's hard to do and really win at something, you do have to be all in. What is the line of, I'm all in 100% focused? Think about Elon Musk. Elon mm -hmm. Musk is the most focused all in person there could be. Sure. So are his flaws similar to that? He's not seeing these other things. I mean, he tweeted that coronavirus is dumb like a month ago. <laughs> he, not. he tweeted that the coronavirus panic is dumb, which <laughs> might still be true. He did get ventilators, though. Remember, wasn't he the one that first got the ventilators? Yeah. But we'll see how he how he emerges from this. <laughs> He's a controversial guy, isn't he? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, he was. He was. He, he used to be. He could do no wrong in my eyes. I don't know. I haven't made up my opinion on him. But yet. he's a complex character. He's an absolute genius, and he's all in and a hundred percent focused. Mm -hmm. Is that the guy that's going to win? And what's going to be the consequence of being him all in and focused on? Building, 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 going forward. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's it's an interesting thought. Well, I like how he is resigned to the fact that if he fails, it's like all on him. And he knows that. Yeah. yeah. He yeah. accepts that. Isn't that unbelievable? Yeah. I mean, he's risked his personal net worth countless times. I mean, he's put everything on the line to just mm -hmm. put himself back at square one if things don't go right uh, multiple times. You got to respect somebody that that has that extreme of ownership, like Jocko Willis. Like the ultimate expression of putting skin in the game, for sure. A billionaire has to be a little bit insane to get there, unless they got it from their family. He is slightly insane. I would submit that I am slightly insane. Um, you have to be a little kooky and crazy and sometimes go, I'm betting on red 43 on the roulette wheel and I'm spinning and I'm putting it all on there. Those those people either end up being giant failures, or being giant successes, you know, yeah. never anything in between. You kind of got to think, which kind of person are you? You know, are you a person that is an all in, you know, something to think about. Absolutely. Elon Musk certainly is the all in definition. You definitely seem to have that uh, all in approach as well. Well, it's a little bit nutty too. I mean, you got to be a little bit crazy and nutty to do that. There's a fine line between um, genius and, exactly. and uh, the opposite of genius. Um, who is the most interesting person that you know, and why are they the most interesting person that you know? Ooh, most interesting person I know. Boy, you really got me there. Or someone that comes to mind, you know. Or a few, you can hear some candidates. Okay. I would say that one of the most interesting people I've ever met is a person I met in Haiti, in the country of Haiti, who was in rural Haiti when I took a bunch of students down there to teach business classes. And he was one of the smartest people I met, but he was in a situation that there was no way out of. Okay. He was 20 years old, his name was Richardson, and he had grown up around Port-au-Prince, Haiti. And I took university students down there to teach classes and he was at some of the classes. He spoke three languages, he was brilliant. I've 
Haiti has been in a revolution the last year, so I haven't been able to go down there, but I've kind of kept up with him. He's one of the most remarkable people, and I would say that's what I view as interesting. A person that somehow has an extraordinarily high IQ, extraordinary work ethic, extraordinary intelligence and creativity, and I don't know where it came from. Mm -hmm. That's why he's so interesting. Okay. He wrote a poem to one of the UA students in French. So in Haiti, they speak Creole, and Richardson also speaks English, and also he knows French. He wrote this complicated poem to one of our students in French. The student also know, knew French. And that student started crying because he said it was the most brilliant thing he ever read. So I think a lot about him and I think about what untapped potential, what a gem in society that has nowhere to go. Why is there nowhere for him to go? So that's a remarkable, interesting person to me. And that goes back to um, like the thing about I, that kid didn't have an ACT tutor. And from that That's moment right. forward, his life was completely different. And, you know, you can apply that to like anyone, like all the kids in Africa might have an insurmountable amount of more potential than I have, but will never be able to even tap into that because of where they're born and their, their situation. And it sounds like this Richardson guy was born with that same um it's that rough. same advantage but was able to you know in some ways rise above it kind of like alexander hamilton like dropped in the middle of a forgotten spot and like right right rode his way out um so that's interesting that's that's, that's very interesting. i would say a lot of the people i met have met on my trips to haiti have changed me the most and i guess when you say interesting that is what i would say is interesting People you'll think about that you haven't seen in a couple years that you wake up in the middle of the night and just start thinking about. So when I think interesting, I think remarkable. Um, and so I would say the people I met in Haiti, a lot of them were some of the most interesting, remarkable people I've ever met. Awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, uh, Kyle, do you have anything left to go over? I think we got most of, most of our questions out. Um, I don't know. There's a lot that's running through my mind just because I can, I'm picking up on things I remember from class and stuff. Yeah, like that. That brings back a lot of stuff. I remember you, you, you like to read a lot. You, you mentioned briefly the audio books. What are, what are a couple books or three books that um, you'd recommend that we read and anybody sure. read? Oh yeah, I love nonfiction and I don't know why. When I was young, I remember reading The Lord of the Rings in fourth grade because um, that was like 1980 or something. Mm -hmm. And I loved all fiction. What's weird is in the last 10 years, I refuse to read fiction and I will get mad at fiction. And I don't know why I won't ring. So I'm all nonfiction. So I would say um, the story of Theranos is one of the best books. Mm, Theranos is this, it, the, it's a nonfiction book. The Wall, a Wall Street Journal editor wrote it. One of the best books. I think it's got the word blood in it. Elizabeth Holmes. That's yes. It talks about That's one of the best. Um, the story of how everybody got behind Theranos when it never had a product. They literally, it was like they had a Lego and they got $9 billion. I can't, I, that yeah, one's just- Andreessen, Some of the smartest VCs in the world put money into her hands. And she... Yeah, it was senators, it was celebrities. It, it made no sense. Um, I've also, anything again, that's nonfiction, I really enjoy. Uh, the one I told you I was reading was The Great Influenza. That is such a good book. That's a great one. Let's see. Oh, oh, I know. There is a series by a doctor named Gawande. Have y'all ever heard of this guy? He's had some bestsellers. Atul Gawande. This is a physician, and he's written books. One was called Being Mortal. Um, oh, Bad Blood was the Theranos one. But Atul Gawande, I've written three, read three of his books, and it talks about the human side of health, healthcare. That's been interesting. And here's another one. I have an obsession with North Korea. So oh, here's a great class, yeah. one. Nothing to Envy by Barbara Demick. Oh, 
<laughs> that is just the best. And I love that. Okay, and finally, here's my last one. Midnight in Chernobyl by Adam Higginbotham. What's that so, one about? So Chernobyl. It's about so, Chernobyl and the crisis. Again, it goes through why everybody made stupid decisions. I don't know why I like going through and seeing the thought process. Maybe I want to learn from that. I don't know. Well, I always, I'm going, why did they do that? It seems on this side that was so stupid. Yeah. And so that's what I like about the Chernobyl. That's what I like about um, all these books. Like I've read a lot about um, the Haitian revolution, stuff like that. What were the decisions, the great pandemic, what were the decisions that were the tipping point? That's always interesting to me. I think that rolls um, really well into maybe our last question. And, um, you know, me and Lewis are very interested in decision-making and um, improving your decision-making the right decision in the face of, um, you know, the given inputs, regardless of the outcome. So what is one decision or one of the best decisions that you've ever made? One of the best decisions I ever made was to come to the university. And I didn't know that at the time. Um, and it was not ideal for me for a while, mm -hmm. but it has turned out to be because of the resources it's offered me. It's truly made my life full and whole. And I feel like I'm close to self-actualization because <laughs> of it. I mean, that's a pretty strong that's statement. I'm getting at the head of the household hierarchy. I mean, I'm happy. So my, coming to the university and the access to what, if you go somewhere and say University of Alabama, doors fling open, that can do so much good in the world. So I realize now I want to make things better to the small extent I can. And now I realize I had no plan when I came to UA, but now I realize that is how it changed my life. UA flings doors open and has the potential to do so much good. So that's a, one of the good decisions I made and didn't know it. Well, that's fantastic. I think this was an awesome, awesome interview. It's better than we could have hoped it would go. Uh, Thank you guys. I really enjoyed having you in class. You guys are exceptional people. I remember us going on the van to Brent, Alabama, and you would sit there in the front in the dreaded front seat spot with me as you put your life in my hands as we ran around the corner and I got to know you. Uh, that was a lot of fun for me. I enjoyed that. Thank you. <laughs> Alrighty, well. Thanks, guys. Luck, I appreciate uh, best this. Best of luck with all the, uh, the efforts, and hopefully we'll spread this out and people can listen to it, and maybe they'll reach out to you about all your efforts in Birmingham right now with everything that's going on. Absolutely. I'd love it. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Bye, guys.